Welcome, everybody. I think you can hear me. This seems very loud. Is it too loud? Should I back up a little bit? OK. I also want to welcome, uh, welcome everybody that's joining us online tonight. Um, I'm just doing a few introductions, and then the real show begins. Um, I want to explain the accessibility measures that we've put in place for tonight. Uh, we have live, in-person ASL interpretation by Anna and Kate, as you can see here. Um, and additionally, those of you who are with us in person may have noticed that there's a monitor at the far end of the stage here in the, re in the recital hall. And that monitor is streaming the UMBC YouTube channel, the same as it is for those online at home. This practice, often used in professional conferences, is for the benefit of those here in our in-person audience so that we, too, have access to live caption streaming. During one short video tonight, we're going to, um, you're going to hear an additional audio track delivering audio description. This was added to make the visual portion of the video clearer to those with low vision or blindness. While we were not able to deliver the entire program this evening with audio description, you may notice we will be giving self-descriptions as we introduce ourselves. We hope to update the final YouTube video of this event in the coming days with audio description as well. When that's posted, updates will be announced. We hope these measures may assist more audiences with a fuller and richer level of access and understanding of the program this evening. So I will start by saying that I'm Kathy O'Dell, and I teach art history here at UMBC. It's been a pleasure to be a part of organizing this event. Um, Maurice Berger and I knew each other in graduate school and were friends before we both were hired here in 1992. So um, this is a very moving experience for me. I'm very honored to be doing this uh, very brief logistical introduction. I should also describe myself. I am a senior white woman with spiky dark hair, and I'm wearing a gray top with black designs and uh, white and black glasses. <clears throat> uh, next, I'd like to read an expanded UMBC land acknowledgement. I'd like to acknowledge the land from which those of us who organize today's event are speaking. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will. Some were drawn to leave their dis distant homes in the hope of a better life. And some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. We acknowledge that UMBC stands on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway Kanai, and Susquehannock peoples. Over time, citizens of many more indigenous nations have come to reside in this region. We humbly offer our respect to all past, present, and future indigenous people connected to this place. We honor the thousands of enslaved Africans whose lives were physically and spiritually stolen for purposes of others profiting from the land on which those slaves labored and we seek to understand our shared responsibilities to engage in liberation, reconciliation, and decolonization of and through our work and everyday actions. And now it is, as it always is for any of us, an exceptional pr uh, pleasure to introduce President Freeman Rabowski who is joining us via video tonight to welcome us all. And welcome to everyone in joining us on YouTube. So next, we will be seeing Freeman. Hello, I'm Freeman Rabowski, president here at UMBC. And I'm delighted to make a statement about my dear friend, our dear friend, Maurice Berger. Soon after the shocking loss of Maurice, amazingly, two years ago in March of 2020, I talked about his scholarly impact on UMBC and on the world. 
But I also talked about that friendship I mentioned, the kind of friendship that grows from shared values, whether talking about the dignity of humankind or the mandate of social justice, the power of art and history to open eyes. Those sentiments are still here. In fact, we feel even more deeply all of what Maurice has done for us as time goes on. We consider the difference that he's made profound. And so tonight, this event is all about legacies. Maurice saw the radical importance of the work of Fred, Fred Wilson. And after George Sissel's creation of Fred's work uh, in that critique, Mining the Museum, amazingly, 30 years ago, Maurice created Fred's first major retrospective at the CADVC 20 years ago, 2001, 2002, Legacies. So George and Maurice, Maurice and Fred created this wonderful alchemical mix that has radiated the work of so many young artists, including our graduate, Chris, who's here tonight also, who, who earned the MFA from UMBC, in fact, and Ashley, uh, who was a part of our faculty before moving on to the Smithsonian. So the idea that all of these wonderful luminaries, um, George and Fred and Chris and Ashley are here tonight to pay tribute to Maurice speaks volumes about the significance of this theme, legacies. And then finally, I want to honor Maurice's husband, Marvin. Marvin, I wish I had taken a photo of Maurice's eyes when he talked about you. The unconditional love, the admiration, the deep abiding friendship. And so while my words can never express it, I want you to know how much we appreciate you, that you are a part of legacies, that your spirit and Maurice's spirit will always be a part of this institution and of the world through this wonderful genius of Maurice Berger. Enjoy yourselves this evening. I am honored to be a part of this celebration. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy O'Dell, for helping me with all of this and keep hope alive. Well, good evening. My name is Sims Gardner. I'm the director of the Center for Art Design and Visual Culture. And I'm going to give a few introductory remarks related to uh, the panelists that are here tonight. And to thank a number of people, uh, individuals, as well as institutions for making this event possible. Um, first of all, I want to thank Lynn Casabon, who is the director of the Center for Innovation, Research, and Creativity in the Arts, Circa and my fellow colleagues at the Center for Art, Design, and Visual Culture. Uh, we work together to partner with this event, but also of critical importance are the Department of Visual Arts here at UMBC, the Office of the Provost, the Office of the Dean of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, the Maryland Center for History and Culture, and of course, last but not least, the Baltimore Museum of Fine Arts. So they all deserve uh, a big thank you and appreciation for making this event possible. Also, special thanks goes to uh, Lynn Casabon, who I mentioned is the director of the Center for Innovation, Research, and Creativity in the Arts at UMBC, as well as professor of visual arts. Um, Kathy O'Dell, who spoke previously, who's associate professor of art history and museum studies and special assistance to the Dean of Edu for Education and Arts Partnership in our College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. Sandra Abbott, who's with the Center for Art, Design, and Visual Culture, and is the Curator of Collections, Educational Outreach with us. And last but not least, again, Cecilia Wickman, who's Associate Curator of Contemporary Art at the Baltimore Museum of Art. All these people uh, played a significant role in bringing this event together. Um, I just realized before I get to my next part, my self-identification is, um, a senior uh, white man with gray hair, 
uh, about to retire, so I'm looking forward to that and I'm very happy to be here tonight. Now, what I want to do very quickly, but it's hard, is introduce the panelists. And I've been told to keep it short, but I also want to say that their accomplishments are formidable and many. So I may err on that, and um, I will start to proceed, okay? So the first person that I want to talk about, of course, is a uh, person who's not here tonight, Maurice Berger, who was, I worked with for over 25 years. Maurice Berger was an American cultural historian, curator and art critic, who served as a research professor and chief curator at the Center for Art, Design, and Visual Culture at UMBC. He was internationally recognized for his interdisciplinary scholarship on race and visual culture in the United States. He curated a number of important exhibitions which examined the relationship between race and American art, including the critically acclaimed For All the World to See, Visual Culture and the Struggle for Civil Rights, which the center partnered with the National Museum of African American History and Culture at the Smithsonian Institution in 2011. For All the World to See focused on the role visual imagery played in shaping, influencing, and transforming the modern struggle for racial equality and justice in the United States. Author of 11 books and numerous articles, anthologies, and exhibition catalogs, his many professional awards included the Infinity Award from the International Center of Photography in 2018 for critical writing and research related to his New York Times column, Race Stories. For all the world to see, the awards were many and included the exhibition in, excuse me, included best exhibition in a university museum in 2010, best exhibition in a university museum and best thematic exhibition in New York in 2008. These were all from the International Association of Art Critics. He was a nominee as well for his uh, interview with WNET in New York when he talked about uh, For All the World to See and that was, you know, given by the National Academy of T Television Arts and Sciences. His book, White Lies, Race and Myths of Whiteness, in 1999 from Farrar, Strauss, and Giraud was named as a finalist for the 2000 Horace Mann Book Award of, within Harvard University, and he received an honorable mention from the Gustavus Myers Outstanding Book Award from Boston University School of Social Work. The companion book which accompanied For All the World to See was nominated in the Choice Outstanding Academic Title 2010, Art and Architecture from American Library Association. And I could go on, but we need to move forward because the next person is just as long and then we'll get, we'll get going. And that's where this slide comes in. And Importantly for me, I just want to say before I give a list of Fred's accomplishments and what he's done and what he continues to do, what was so exciting about working on Fred's retrospective was Fred was with us a lot. I picked him up from the uh, train station a lot, brought him to the, to the center, to, went back to the hotel, but we worked together very intensely. It was wonderful to work with, and that's not true with all of the exhibitions we did. And it's nobody's fault, but it was a wonderful relationship we built. So for me, if someone asked me, well, what does this slide mean? When we put together this, it was a moving moment for me before the show even traveled because it represented how I was trained as a youth going to college or whatever, or even a high school, and looking at a Picasso. And then with his guarded view, it's, it's, uh, the whole exhibition for me was a revelation in that regard, uh, how placement mattered and relationship mattered. So I've always loved this picture of this part of our gallery and what it represents and what your exhibition represented. And I'd already been in Baltimore and had seen Mining the Museum, which was phenomenal. So it wasn't that I was unprepared, it's just by working with the artist, it was really a special, special relationship, but also it was, it was wonderful to report back to Maurice what we had accomplished each day, each week. Okay, 
So Fred Wilson. Fred Wilson is a conceptual artist whose work investigates museological, cultural, and historical issues which are largely overlooked or neglected by museums and cultural institutions. Since his groundbreaking exhibition, Mining the Museum in 1992 at the Maryland Historical Society, Fred Wilson has been subject of more than 40 solo exhibitions around the globe, including previously mentioned our own retrospective objects and installations, 1979 to 2000, which was organized by us here at UMBC. His work has been exhibited extensively in museums, including MoMA, the Museum of Contemporary Art, Chicago, the Institute of Jamaica, West Indies, West Indies, excuse me, the Museum of World Culture, Sweden, and the British Museum in London. His work can be found in public collections internationally, including Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Whitney of Museum of American Art, the Long Museum in Shanghai, and the Tate Modern in London. He has presented his exhibition Afro Kismet at the 2017 Istanbul Biennial in Turkey, and it traveled to London, New York, and Los Angeles. He represented the United States at the Cairo Biennial in 1992 and the Venice Biennale in 2003. His many accolades include the prestigious MacArthur Foundation's Genius Award grant in 1999, the Skowhegan Medal for Sculpture in 2006, the Ford Foundation's Art of Change Fellowship in 2018, and Brandeis University's Creative Arts Award in 2019. Next is George Sissel, who has mounted groundbreaking exhibitions and taught courses in fine arts and humanities for close to 50 years. He was the founder and director of the George Sissel Gallery and the Baltimore's The Contemporary. From 2019, I'm sorry, from 2009, excuse me, from 1997 to 2017, he served as curator of residence at the Maryland Institute College of Art, consulting on the development of community-based and public programming, concentrating on exploring new models for connecting art, artists, and audiences. At the Maryland Institute College of Art, he introduced and taught the exhibition development seminar until 2008 and directed the MFA in curatorial practice from 2011 to 16. Lee Boot, well, who will be up right after me to talk a little bit about the video for Fred's exhibition. I'm sorry for mining the museum, excuse me. He is the director of the Imaging Research Center at UMBC and is an experimental media artist working to develop new and effective ways to, do, to use digital media to spread knowledge for pro-social outcomes. As the initiator and principal investigator of numerous research projects funded by the National Institute of Health and Private Foundation, he has assembled widely interdisciplinary teams from the sciences, arts, and humanities to explore the potential of an artist's perspective to address vexing social issues. He created the short video Mining the Museum Lobby Tape 1991, which introduced Wilson's installation at the Maryland Historical Society. And the last two people, i get to everybody. Ashley Minner is a community-based visual artist from Baltimore, Maryland. Ashley is an enrolled member of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina. She earned her MFA in 2011 and MA in 07 in Community Arts from Maryland Institute College of Art, and her PhD in 20 from, in American Studies, excuse me, from University of Maryland College Park. In addition to maintaining her practice as a community-based artist, she works currently as Assistant Curator for History and Culture at the Smithsonian National Museum of American Indian in Washington, D.C. Chris Kojar received his BA from George Washington University and his MFA from UMBC. He has been awarded residencies at La, La Napoule Art Foundation in Mandalou, La Napoule, France. Is that good, Tom? Okay, thank you, I, I tried. The Creative Art Alliance in Baltimore, Maryland and the Santa Fe Art Institute in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And he's volunteered at the Agency of Artists in Exile in Paris, France. His collaborative trio, Strikeware, has received grants from the Robert W. Deutsch Foundation, Maryland State Arts Council, and the William G. Baker Fund. Chris was recently awarded the Andrew Harris Fellowship at the University of Vermont 
and is currently collaborating with his mother, the artist Aletha Devane, on two public art sites in Baltimore, Maryland. All right, I'm done. <laughs> but now you know who's on the stage. Okay, thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, my name is Lee Boot. I was introduced by um, Sims a minute ago, so I direct the Imaging Research Center here. Uh, I'm an older white man. I have uh, a bald head. I have a beard, which is getting kind of uh, gray. I'm wearing glasses, red shirt, black vest. It's an honor to be here at this event, playing just a, a small um, part in it, but uh, my involvement in this was a big deal to me. It, it was really a life-changing um, event, so it, I'm, again, truly honored. We're going to show, I think appropriately at the beginning of this, uh, the video that we made for, it was the lobby of the, of the Maryland Historical uh, Society that kind of oriented visitors to the show as to what this exhibition was really about, because it was so novel. Um, so we'll just roll the video initially and then I'll make a few remarks um, afterward. This is, uh, this is 30 years old. In black. Last night, I dreamt I was at the Maryland Historical Society. Paintings, sculpture. All the artworks were the same. They were old paintings and marble busts and silver teapots, but somehow everything looked different. Nothing was as I expected, and yet everything made sense. A man's reflection on Why? a teapot. I know this dream means something, but it's going to take me a long time to figure it all out. The bearded man saunters past displayed paintings. A museum should be a place where anything can happen. A white boy in a ruffled collar with his dog. An exhibition is an experience where you should expect the unexpected. Another white boy. It should make you think. A boy of color. It should make you feel something for the person who made the objects you are looking at. He wears a slave shackle collar. Art is like an exhibition. It makes you question. It makes you wonder. It opens you up to new emotions and the discovery of new ways to experience the world around you. Now shirtless, the man gazes at a painting. Art is like history. The more you experience it, the man turns to face us. The more you learn about yourself. Seen through a window, a miniature home. Installation art is a way some contemporary artists work to create an environment all around us which actively stimulates our senses and gets us to reflect on our experience of looking in an unexpected way. In installation art, there are no limits to the kinds of materials an artist can use. Paint, wood, photographs, video, sound, light. Pressing a button. Ordinary objects we use every day. An up elevator button. Hi, I'm Fred Wilson, and I'm an artist. The artworks and historical objects on the third floor are the materials I chose and arranged to create the installations, Mining the Museum. He jogs past displays. Mining the Museum represents my own personal vision of the Maryland Historical Society. But Mining the Museum is not only on the third floor. As I mine the museum's collections, I left messages for you in other places around the museum. Voice and performance by Fred Wilson. Directed and produced by Lee Boot. Camera work by Michael Barnes, 1992. Well, that's a trip down memory lane. I think that there's a link where you can see that, uh, that the Maryland Historical, well, it's not the Maryland Historical Society anymore, is it? Uh, the Maryland Center for History and Culture um, has, uh, I don't know if we're gonna make that available or not. It's a little bit hard to see it with all the light here. Um, anyway, 30 years ago is a long time. Uh, neuroscientists tell us that remembering is just your brain making stuff up. Um, from the few scraps that might be left up there. Uh, so take what I say with a grain of salt, because um, <laughs> I really, I, the flashes I have about this process were, um, are, are, are few, but, but they're deep. Um, 
so we had a couple of weeks to do this after George uh, called me. And uh, we agreed to record Fred interacting with the objects, with the arrangements, as you saw, that the rearrangements of objects, I should say, that he constructed um, in, the, in the museum. And we'd work at night, was the idea. The museum would be, would be cloaked in darkness, and we'd have it to ourselves, which was really fun. So we had a night uh, at the museum with, with Fred Wilson. Um, Fred figured out what he would do and where he would do it, and that was a lot, because there were, it was very extensive, uh, the exhibition. Um, I figured out how to best get that with the camera, and uh, Michael Barnes figured out uh, how to shoot it. He was the videographer who did all my video art before 2000 and did a terrific job. Uh, the three of us alone in the museum was wonderful. What a place to play, can you imagine? Um, and it was like we were sneaking something. That was, that's like the impression I still have of that uh, moment. Of course, the Historical Society had agreed to do this show. We didn't sneak the whole thing, did we, George? Um, well, well done. But you know, their history provided, obviously, a much larger truth. What we were doing was completely renegade. That was the impression that I was, that I was left with. Um, and you know, an artist who would almost certainly have been um, excluded previously was entering under the cover of darkness to make art at a time, in a place, and in ways that were never intended by those who would have built this museum. Fred wrote and recorded after we shot this, the narration, I edited it all together, uh, done and done. It all happened very quickly. Obviously, none of us at the time, and I think this goes for this whole enterprise and what we're celebrating tonight, um, none of us at the time could have known how pivotal this exhibition would become. Certainly, I did not. But I did know that the experience resonated with me deeply. It became a pivotal inspiration for me to build a renegade career of my own, also trying to make art where I'm not supposed to. And I know it inspired countless, of other, countless others similarly. So for this, I will be forever grateful, uh, and of course blame, um, Fred, George, Lisa, and all the others who made this exhibition um, possible. So thank you for including me. Sound on? Sound on? OK, thank you. Uh, and, and thank you, Lee and, and Sims and, and Kathy, for your uh, preliminary remarks. But I want to also thank, the, really, the two behind the scenes people um, that I work with the most closely in this last year, and that is Lynn Casabon, who invited me to, to, to UMBC to work on this project and to invite the panelists uh, to celebrate Maurice and, and Fred, and also to Sandra Abbott for her continuing commitment to accessibility here at UMBC and to disability justice. Um, my name is George Sissel. I'm a senior white man with a mustache and a beard wearing a Paisley shirt. Um, my real thanks, of course. My real thanks goes to, thank you, <laughs> goes to Maurice. Um, the exhibition that, that everyone's been talking about that was here at UMBC in terms of uh, the sort of the mid-career point for Fred's uh, retrospective, that the, the essay that Maurice wrote in there I think says a lot for what this panel is going to be talking about. Um, and I think he's, his foresight in this essay, which he entitled, Collaboration, Museums, and the Politics of Display. Um, I think you'll be seeing that as a theme throughout both Ashley and Chris and Fred's presentations. But to me personally, in terms of Maurice, goes before that. And that was his memoir, called White Lies, which was pivotal to me in really thinking about issues of racial and social justice 
uh, myself also growing up in Baltimore, what that meant to me. Um, and again, that, that book is almost 30 years old also. And I've used it many, many times as a textbook at MICA for my graduate and my undergraduate students. And I also keep it, that's why I don't have a copy here, because I've given so many copies away that, um, but I encourage you, if you have not read it, uh, to read that book. The other is the issue of Maurice's legacy. So for me, his real legacy is in the future generations of curators and critics. And this is what you see playing out on the stage here and also in the art world itself. I want to read you a quote that was um, from a, an article that was posted online when uh, Maurice died. And I think you'll understand the importance of his influence on another generation of curators and critics. Years ago, at the start of my development as a black queer curator, reading Berger's words helped focus the type of work I wanted to do. Now I want my words and my exhibitions to echo his bravery and his legacy. Berger was never afraid to name and make racism obvious in spaces that were predominantly white and that often wanted to pretend that racism did not exist. The foundation of my own curatorial practice is my belief that black people, black creators, are cultural architects a belief that Maurice Berger echoed through his tirelessly consistent work. This is Terry Henderson, who is a, a colleague of mine, someone I admire a great deal here in Baltimore, who is the Connect, Collect Connect Gallery Coordinator and a BMORE staff writer. Uh, that, again, his work goes back many years for her, his readings, and especially the book White Lies to her, uh, what it meant to her. So I just want to sort of set that stage in terms of why we're honoring Maurice, what his importance is, what a touchstone he has been, both for me, obviously for Fred, and for younger people like Chris and Ashley and, and, and Terry and many, many, many more. I'm sure probably on, on the YouTube, people will be typing in now uh, their comments about what Maurice meant to them. Um, so I just want to describe briefly what our panel agenda is going to be. So uh, Ashley and Chris will present first uh, about their, their practice, and then followed by Fred, and then we'll have a panel discussion among ourselves, and then we'll open it up to Q&A with you all. So prepare your questions as you're listening to their three presentations. So Ashley, welcome you up. Wow, what an honor to be in conversation and in the company of so many people I admire, um, many of whom have mentored me. Thank you for having me. I'm a 30-something American Indian woman with long black and silver hair, and I'm wearing a black shirt and a tan jacket. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, very quickly, I'm an enrolled member of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina. Lumbees make up the largest population of American Indian people in the city of Baltimore, even though we're not indigenous to this place. We are um, generally unexpected. Nobody expects to run into an American Indian person here. We're left out of formal histories of Baltimore as well as popular narratives. We get a lot of silly questions. So a lot of my practice has been about reinserting us into those narratives. Um, this work that you see, uh, when I was in graduate school for community art in, at MICA in Jan Rosenkrantz's class, folklorist Elaine F. Uh, hi Jan. Folklorist Elaine F. visited to teach us how to do oral histories, and I went home and recorded my uncle John telling a story, just a story. I didn't say about what I wanted, just you know, could you tell me one and I'll record you, about working. Um, because work was what brought our people out of North Carolina to, to Baltimore. And um, when I brought that recording back to class, it got such a reaction that I realized more people than just me really could relate 
and enjoy Uncle John's stories. And then I started to record more Lumbee elders. And um, also without prompting, these elders told me work stories because they shared that um, reason for coming to Baltimore. I embedded these stories into artist books, which eventually made their way to the Baltimore Museum of Industry for a show called Hard Work and Pilgrims, Baltimore, um, Lumbee Indians in Baltimore City Industry. Uh, nobody thought anything of calling the Indians pilgrims at the time. And um, I show you this picture because um, the best part of this whole project and all of its iterations was this night where elders of our community came to the museum and saw their stories as part of the greater story of labor that built our city. So here they are dressed up and being so proud. Um, next slide, please. And then later I did a series with folks from my generation when we were all about 30 um, as a way of reminding us that we are beautiful and important and a part of something much greater than ourselves. Um, Baltimore City has a way of making us believe that we don't belong here or don't deserve nice things or a good quality of life. And this series was about uh, changing those ideas or just reminding us um, of who we are and where we come from. And so I collaborated with my good friend who's a photographer. Uh, we, we took portraits of 30 folks from my generation. I uh, asked them to wear whatever they like to the photography studio. So you can see we're wearing contemporary street clothes. Um, it was a way of looking at style of Baltimore Lumbee young people. And the text you see in the background was taken from surveys intended to elicit positive thoughts about our lives, like what are you most proud of, what's special about being Lumbee or from Baltimore. You can go to the next slide. Some people wrote a lot more than others. And these were um, printed at almost life size and then hung at eye level, so anybody who visited the installation would have to reckon with this is what American Indian people look like in this place. You know, we're, we're all around you, you're, we're your neighbors, your friends, sometimes your family members. Next slide, please. And I called it the Exquisite Lumbee Project because it began with this exquisite corpse book, um, which was a comment on the way that our people run the full gamut of skin tones, hair tones, um, eye color, hair texture. Yet when you scramble our features, you come up with a whole new exquisite lumbi. Um, next slide, please. So we do have a distinctive look. And again, the best part of this project was the original opening when all of my peers got dressed up and came out to see themselves in the gallery and other people so proud to see them in the gallery. And I knew it was a success because at the time, everybody wanted their portrait to be their Facebook profile picture. And then at the opening, everybody wanted a picture with their portrait, and that became their Facebook profile picture. Um, next, please. OK, and then um, for the past 15 years or so, uh, I, until recently, have been living in my grandparents' home. All of my grandparents, not just the Lumbee one, came from points further south seeking work and a better quality of life in the city, like so many people in Baltimore have. And my grandparents later passed away, and I had all their things around me, still do all the time. And I started to think about um, how they're still very much present in the objects and in the spaces that remain. So this is a portrait of my grandparents' cast iron skillet that was actually made by one of my great grandfathers, and I still use it to this day, but once again collaborated with a photographer to elevate it to this kind of art object um, status. Next slide, please. And then I created an installation called Trace, the Presence and Absence, where I hung these portraits of objects from the home, um, as well as installed some objects from the home, the ways people are present when they're not. For example, there's a, that cardboard box in the background contains the personal effects of one of my uncles who was killed in an accident in the 70s. In my whole life, he's just been a box of things in the attic. Um, another box was a collection of letters that, written by my first cousin who was in pre prison at the time. Um, and then these scopes, the telescope pictures that you see hanging down contained um, family photos. Uh, 
and some are hung too high, some too low to be easily viewable, kind of like memories. It was taken by, uh, taken like a comment on Judith Levy's piece, Memory Cloud, where our memories are all around us all the time, but they're not always accessible. And people had a lot of fun with the scopes. Next slide, please. And so then finally, this was um, converted into an installation for submersive productions at a, at a church um, on St. Paul Street. Uh, an immersive theater piece, which I'm not a, a theater person at all and never will be, definitely after this. Um, so you create an installation and one or two people come in to interact with it and you in real time for about five minutes. My installation was uh, like the living room at my grandparents' house, but it also had portraits of objects and these scopes. And I would talk to the people about where they were and what the things meant and ask them about their things and their places and their people. And people cried on me. They were like rushing out to find the dress or the ring or the plate or the, the thing that connects them to their people just to make sure they knew where it was, to touch it, make sure it's safe. So that was intense. Next slide, please. And then most recently, um, I've been researching our Lumbee and actually, actually the whole American Indian community, which is more diverse than just Lumbee, in Baltimore. Um, apparently, it was much more established before my time. Around the turn of the century, there were anywhere from two to 7,000 Indians living in a little neighborhood that bridges Washington Hill and Upper Fells Point. And um, I've been doing extensive archival research and interviews with my elders to reconstruct that neighborhood, all the businesses and photos and all the information we could find about it. And we recently released this guide to East Baltimore's historic American Indian Reservation that is print and lovely. And then there's a website and there's also a cell phone walking tour app called Guide to Indigenous Baltimore, all of which are findable via baltimoreservation.com. I think that was my last slide. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, uh, Fred. Uh, and thank you, um, George. Uh, I appreciate being here. This is um, uh, good coming back to UMBC. Um, my name is Christopher Koitsar. I am a tall man uh, using he, him, his pronouns. Um, I have a kind of raw sienna, yellow ochre color skin, um, short cropped black hair, and um, yeah, wearing a blue denim shirt and another uh, t-shirt with a black rainbow on it. Um, so just to get into my slides, um, this has been uh, kind of like uh, a show of four or three different bodies of work. Uh, this piece right here was started at UMBC and really inspired by um, an exhibition that Maurice brought to UMBC for, from 1999, Adrian Piper's uh, exhibition. Um, I was looking into her work on the mythic being, uh, the calling cards that she did, um, and I started doing a drawing performance uh, where I would go around in the streets of DC, Baltimore, and um, take this approach of what it means to loiter or be at leisure as a black man in public space. Um, I, the, the sketchbook became the activator that had people approach me and the interactions turned into various forms of dialogue with uh, everyday people and police officers. Um, you can go to the next slide. So, when I went to uh, New York, um, one day my friend kind of was like, hey, you should try out the Oculus Hub to do your, uh, your drawing performance. And um, within seconds, police and security guards came up to me and questioned what I was doing and why I was drawing uh, on a notebook. And really, the, the inception of this drawing performance, and I, I've written down some stuff because I, I kind of don't want to talk off, uh, off pattern, but uh, I look back at this drawing performance, how it mythologizes the struggle of black bodies and its earnest alignment with um, an archetype in France called the flaneur, and I'm challenged by it. The flaneur was something that I aligned this practice to when I was doing my, under, my graduate research um, in discovering what loitering is in public space. 
And I was conflicted by um, aligning it with the flaneur because it righteously signifies what it means to loiter within a classist construct without recognizing the visceral, visceral trauma, bodily danger, and the real, real unsettling nature of constantly engaging with police bodies as a black man in America, while conversely underserves the trauma that is contained within the bodies of police men. And I think in a lot of these slides that I, I ended up making, um, these, these performances, um, they were uh, a learning process, kind of like a self-education of what it means to intuitively be watched and be seen in public space as a black man, but also uh, what it means to be seen as a pedestrian in uh, kind of a heavily surveilled culture. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So this came into a whole uh, iteration of handmade sculptures that people could uh, interact with. And this became part of my broader practice of interacting with, um, with sculptures. So uh, in this piece, uh, you could actually look through um, the viewfinder uh, to see the body cam footage that I was wearing at the time when the police at the Oculus Hub came up to me. So you could kind of like rotate it and see my head uh, you could see the conversation that was happening between me and police and security guards. And really, none, none of the dialogue shows um, anything illegal happening. Um, and nothing illegal was happening. I think there's, there's just generally this idea of this interaction became the art form, the interaction with people. And I developed a, a whole body of work about this. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, when I started looking at what it means to activate public space, um, I'm jumping forward now to what I'm working on now and what I'm collaborating on now with my, with my mother who's actually here today. Um, we've been looking at these alignments between um, people in spaces and people in public space. And when we started researching what the square in Lexington Market once was, uh, we found these articles with the help of the Peel Center, um, various, uh, various articles from the, the early 19th century of uh, one, a runaway slave who was on the, uh, was people were searching for, whose name was Robert, and another uh, woman who was sold in Lexington Market, um, the one recorded instance of a woman sold in Lexington Market. So uh, in this development of this sculptural piece, um, which is actually a public art piece, uh, which will be on, uh, which will be installed in September 2022. Um, we looked at these two people, and we wanted to figure out how to um, call upon a history that acknowledges uh, what it what it was in uh, times prior to be a black person, and how that relates to what it is now. You can go to the next slide. Um, I find kind of like a through fair with my work as I was surveilled. Um, very lightly and very earnestly and almost like as a performance of documenting public space and seeing how Robert, uh, who is a slave that was um, actively sought out as a runaway slave uh, or an enslaved person actually, um, what it meant for him to be um, under surveillance in Lexington Market and what it meant for Rosetta to be surveilled in Lexington Market or to be documented as a, a person of, uh, of color. Uh, these are the articles that came out from um, various newspaper articles of the um, uh, 1833 and 1838, uh, the early 19th century, that are going to actually be granite flagstones that will be placed within the um, as markers to uh, the sculptural, the public art piece that's there in the market now, or that will be in the market. Um, and just to kind of go off of this. Um, it, it was kind of a, a look at what corporate space is now and how we value uh, the things we give in exchanging goods in, in corporate space and what it means also to be at, at leisure and celebrate what it means to be a person of color in public space. Um, you can go to the next slide. So this, uh, this is actually um, one thing that I also want to read. Uh, today, I think, uh, was a good day to kind of uh, show uh, what their, the absence of what's here um, is, a, is actually a public art piece that um, 
my mother actually was a part, was very much the lead on. And uh, the expectation for this memorial began in September of 2005. Uh, at the outset, a group of constituents at McDonough undertook a historical study of enslaved people at the McDonough plantation. And you can go to the next slide. Uh, where I created these plaques that show um, uh, these plantations or uh, the, the ships that people went on when they went, uh, were traveling back to Liberia after um, being freed from, from the plantation. Um, after this, the estate was sold, um, the 100 people that were ultimately sold as a part of uh, McDonough's executors in his will um, stated that these assets uh, helped uh, the formation of both New Orleans Public City Schools and the McDonough School in Owings Mills, Maryland. So in 2020, um, there was a, uh, a kind of reckoning of what to do with this space. And um, today was the uh, memorialization of the memorial to those enslaved and freed in McDonough. You can go to the next slide. So I, I feel like I, want to hit upon several things that I do, but it's hard to really claim um, that I don't work without collaborators and I don't work, um, I work very intuitively, but a lot of people kind of uh, give me the, the strength and the kind of courage to come up with the pieces that I come up with. Um, after reviewing um, the Museum of the Bible show of uh, the Slave Bible, I kind of undertook this performance piece where I uh, spent three and a half hours cutting out passages that were removed from the Bible. Uh, this was part of a greater exhibition done by the Strikewear Collective with Jeffrey Gangwish and Molly Bendel and myself at uh, the Peel Center in Baltimore. Um, this piece was a hard piece to do. I'm not, uh, I don't really have uh, any tie to Christianity per se, like I wasn't raised Christian, but um, in uncovering what it was, what the slave Bible was, and uh, what it meant to um, excise or omit portions of this work or this book to teach other people in the British West Indies um, how to live and how to be subservient, um, really struck a chord with what the show Renovations was about, which was um, on display uh, in January of 2020. Uh, this crossover between um, really education, Christianity, and the American institution of slavery had all these underlying themes in this exhibit. And when uh, I, I looked at this book, I looked at the, uh, which is really called Parts of the Holy Bible Selected for the Use of Negro Slaves, um, I saw it as a, as a chance to kind of really uncover how um, Christianity and uh, the black community, uh, or particularly uh, in the 19th century black community, uh, educated their youth and how it was used um, kind of as a, um, both a purposeful alignment to faith and also as a questioning of one's uh, place in society. Uh, there was about a thousand copies of the slave Bible that were produced in 1807. Um, and this exhibit renovations that I'm, you can actually go to the next slide, I'm maybe moving too fast. Um, it took upon a lot of different uh, approaches to what um, buildings were important to black history in general. So it started with the Peel Center, uh, which served as male and female colored school number one in, in Baltimore, one of the first schools that educated uh, um, uh, blacks in, in Baltimore. And it spun out to look at several buildings. The Baltimore Institute of Musical Arts, which is now the center for the Afro-American newspaper. Uh, it looked at the Claiborne Temple um, uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, which was the site of the sanitation worker strikes of 1968. And this piece here, uh, with uh, the help of Anasa Troutman, uh, gave me the kind of propensity to like say, let me document these buildings. Let me show the life that was in these buildings and um, make, make work about it, make conceptual artwork about it. So uh, viewers are invited to pick up the hands of this piece and look around at a uh, 360 de uh, degree video of uh, the Claiborne Temple, which was in very much a state of disrepair um, and now is only beginning to kind of see the, see the light of day as, as a, uh, 
as a place of worth, which um, for the entire American society. So a lot of these buildings that we looked at at renovations, um, you know, there were schoolhouses that were burned down in the 19th century that were only to be rebuilt as museums. Um, the Baltimore Institute of Musical Arts was also served many other uh, uh, served many other purposes throughout its life. Uh, but as the Baltimore Institute of Musical Arts, it was a building that basically. Um, served as a school for children to go to because they couldn't attend the, the, the Peabody Institute um, during the, the 40s. Um, so we looked at these buildings and we, we found kind of a life and a narrative and imagined what it would be like for, uh, to activate these buildings. Um, and it took place at the Carroll Mansion in, uh, in Baltimore. Uh, you can go to the next slide. The whole exhibit really uh, uncovered and looked at the lives of nine graduates, the first nine high school black graduates of Baltimore. And in this work, um, we uncovered uh, stories about, um, for instance, William H. Murray, who was the father of Pauli Murray. Um, and William H. Murray, uh, we connected to uh, a whole slew of newspaper articles that dealt with his really troubled past. Um, and how it inspired Polly Murray to become an activist in her work. Uh, there was uh, another teacher, Molly, Molly T uh, Taylor, um, who uh, went on to become like uh, a principal and uh, one of the outstanding principals of the Baltimore Public City School System. There's actually a school named after her now. And a lot of these works um, are interactive, like the original sculpture that I showed you, uh, the Tower Viewer. So people are invited to sit in the sculpture. People are invited to use um, a, a cellular device to, augment, to activate aug uh, augmented reality, to see a silhouetted portrait of each, uh, each member of uh, the high school graduates or the high school class seated at the pew. Um, and the whole exhibit was an installation exhibit. So, so it kind of like, um, took over the second floor of the Carroll Mansion using sound, using uh, uh, augmented reality, using video work, using water, um, using uh, chalk as a, um, a way to, to uncover uh, what history was for the Peel Center and for uh, the Carroll Mansion. Um, that's kind of all I have. Um, I think the work is... Uh, sometimes speaks better for itself than I think that the artist can speak for it. But um, I really want to thank um, the people that were available for uh, uncovering these historical narratives. So Tanika Berkeley, um, Dean Kremel, uh, Dr. Brian Morrison, these were people that kind of let us engage with uh, the narratives that they, that they had uncovered. Um, we were not historians, we were artists. And I think a, a lot of this work that when I'm, when I'm becoming like, uh, whether a performer or a sculptor or a conceptual artist or a public artist, like a public art creator, um, there's, I'm always interested in narratives. I'm always interested in pulling out a narrative that um, stands as a testament to something that um, is more than who I am. So um, yeah, it's kind of been a, a wild four years, um, and it's been great, and um, I hope to continue to do stuff like this. Thank you. Yeah. Let's see if I can... Okay, here's my face. <laughs> Thank you guys, they're really great. Really very inspiring, both of you. <sighs> oh, yes. Um, I'm gonna try to go through a lot of images very quickly. Uh, this is not my painting, obviously. Uh, this is historic painting. Um, it was uh, my mother, who was an art teacher and uh, an artist herself in her own right, uh, had coffee table books on the coffee table. And one of them uh, had this painting in it by Tiepolo. And uh, as a child, I asked her, who was that, who was that boy at, next to the painting? And she didn't know. Next slide. Uh, 
forgetting about that image and that idea for you know a long, long time. I moved, went on uh, working on um, uh, various projects because I was really fascinated with museums and I worked in museums, the Muse Metropolitan Museum and the Museum of Natural History and the American Crafts Museum when it was called that. And I, um, uh, that was just all freelance work. But because I was an artist and because I, I uh, was a museum goer uh, and also taught in the museum, I had these three different perspectives of, as visitor, uh, teacher and uh, artist in when I'm in the museum and sometimes all those identities kind of conflicted. I should say, speaking about identity, I have some wild crazy dreads on my head and uh, I'm wearing a, a black jacket with uh, a blue shirt and, um, and I'm African American but probably similar in complexion as my cohort sitting there. Um, so anyway, I, uh, so I started thinking about museums and how they, they manipulate uh, the viewer because I was seeing many different vantage points thinking about museums. And, and the only way for me to kind of under, really understand that was to make uh, displays that uh, mimic museums and try to unpack and understand what they were really, what that kind of uh, uh, visual, visual space, that performative space, uh, what that does to meaning and to viewers. And, uh, and so this, this work, actually this is not a museum, as, as some people thought when I, when I when it was up in the gallery. Uh, they, well, actually one woman walked in and said, oh, I'm looking for contemporary art, and she left. That's a hazard of some of my works, but anyway. Uh, um, so this was called the Colonial Collection. Uh, next slide. Uh, these were masks uh, that had French and British flags uh, across them. This is one of my first early works. And uh, inside the display case were little boxes with insects in them. And it said, um, what did it say? I'm forgetting my own work from years ago. Um, collection, uh, British and French collection, 1914. And uh, and actually, on oh, next slide, Hans Hacke said to me, where'd you find that mask with that flag on it? That's amazing. I said, Hans, I put that mask on. I you didn't, anyway. Um, but it's because these, as we, as you know, whatever, 30, near 30 years later, everybody knows that things in museums were not necessarily uh, handed with love to institutions, and certainly something of uh, these older African things came out during, during the wars, uh, various wars between the British and, the, and various African communities and the French and various African communities. Next slide. Uh, this mask was on the wall, had no label with it. Uh, I'm no no uh, change to the mask, but next slide had a label. Uh, now, no museum in the right mind would have this label, but um, certainly um, things that, that old things were stolen, and uh, or they may have a word acquired by the museum, and blah blah blah. It doesn't really say how. Uh, and this was my private collection, so I could, that was the only true thing on there. Um, Next slide. Um, this project uh, is called Pantare, a gallery of ancient classical art. And I thought I'd show this because there are two works from this project at the BMA right now. One is owned and one was borrowed. Um, so each of these, I uh, traveled to Egypt a great deal because my father was working there as a civil engineer rebuilding Port Said. And, uh, and it was quite interesting from that vantage point to look at history. Uh, each, each of these uh, Greek, Greek, Greco-Roman uh, statues are, have their ancient Egyptian names. Uh, the cultures were very close to each other and, and ideas and images did pass between the two, between you know, the Mediterranean and, and Upper Egypt. Next. 
And um, the, this is one of the works at, uh, at uh, the BMA right now, owned by a fabulous collector uh, who is no longer with us, but her granddaughter loaned it to the museum. And uh, I, loved, I loved that collector so much. She was great. She came around quite a bit. And uh, of course, you love them even more when they buy something. But anyway, that's besides the point. Um, uh, but I had it, this gallery of, of objects uh, where the cultures were, would come together in kind of forceful ways uh, and then leave the, the, the detritus of the breakage around. Um, it's, that is the, the head of Bast, the cat god in Egypt, and, and the body of Artemis, both of them directly related to each other, but of course never would be seen that way. So I decided to bring them together in this way. Next image. And this is the other work that is, in, that is actually in the collection. Um, I don't even know if I titled it or not because it was just what it was. And I, I didn't break the nose off the other, the black figure, by the way. Uh, next image. Yeah. Next image. And so the, the gallery uh, was in the basement of, uh, of the larger gallery, uh, Metro Pictures. Uh, and uh, you know, I painted the walls this light blue room because at the time I was traveling around giving lectures in different you know, museum settings and always their ancient galleries had, were, in, you know, were in light blue rooms. I don't know, maybe it was the sky in Greece at the time, I don't know. Wedgwood maybe had something to do, I don't know. But I wanted to sort of, emulate that so that you got a, a feeling of a museum even though this was in a gallery. And all these objects came together in rather forceful ways. Next slide. A bunch of them I thought figured since there were two here, I just should, wanted to give you the full context of this idea and the many ways that it, you know, represented itself in these works. Really fun to do. Next slide. Oh, I think I felt like that when after college. Uh, uh, luckily, I didn't get rid of all those books. They came in really handy. Uh, so you have all the great tomes of, of, uh, of world art, so-called, and then um, African art uh, underfoot, or the basis for all the rest. If you go back to Lucy, it's called Atlas. Next image. Uh, this project uh, was at Metro Pictures, another gallery space of theirs. I painted the wall, so it didn't look like Metro Pictures much. And, uh, and these are various works in them. These, uh, these cases, next slide, had skeletons in them, and each one had a label. Someone's mother, someone's father, someone's sister, someone's brother. And at the time, I was just thinking how archaeologists would go and dig up, uh, dig up uh, skeletons and such, as, as I would see in the basements of museums uh, when visiting, that most of that stuff would not be on view, but they have that stuff. And, um, and the notion that, that these belong to someone, were someone, is lost in the scholarship. I had another little joke to make, but I've forgotten the damn joke, sorry. Um, next slide. Ah, uh, I think that particular piece was also, was in Maurice's show, uh, and as, as these were. And these were both in the original show at, at Metro Pictures. Uh, um, the relationship between four and four uh, was, you know, not uh, by accident. Uh, this is called Guarded View, and uh, these are four museum guards from very, four different museums uh, in New York City. I actually convinced one, gallery, one museum to actually loan the actual guard uniform, uh, although at the Met, um, what was, which one was it, the Met or the, I think MoMA, uh, I, I asked the, uh, uh, the lead guard if I could borrow a guard's uniform. He said, well, no, what if somebody came in with a guard's uniform, they could 
with that uniform and they could s steal things. And I'm like, all right, all right, never mind, never mind. So I just approximated the guard's uniform. But really, they're, they're headless, uh, they're anonymous, and I was a guard in, um, at my college museum, and it was a very strange experience. I didn't do it for long, but it's a strange experience where you're, you're basically, um, uh, basically on display, but you're also invisible. It's a, it was a very strange experience, and um, and you know, they'll, people will come and like you're an object, or not look, or not look at you because they looked at the objects, and uh, uh, but you were there, you were just there. Next slide. Now, after working, uh, thinking about museum environments and, and, and art and uh, relationships, um, these two people just came to visit me and just, just convinced me to come to Baltimore <laughs> to, to do a project anywhere in Baltimore. They said, you can use any museum in Baltimore. We will, you, you pick them and we'll try to convince them to let you come and work with their things. I said, well, I always wanted to work in, within a museum, but never thought it was ever going to happen. And uh, so we did that. We walked around and talked. I talked to various you know, museum directors, and I don't know if they knew why I was talking, why they brought this artist from New York to talk to them about their museum. But at any rate, I did speak to m many museums. And I, um, but when I walked into the what was then the Maryland Historical Society, I had a visceral reaction. Not that anybody was any different, but I had a, this feeling in my body that, um, a very uncomfortable feeling in my body. I wondered, you know, I worked at the Metropolitan, I've been in period rooms, I've seen things like this. Why this is, am I being affected so much by this space? And I thought, well, if I'm, you know, out of all the museums, if it's in my body, if I'm having this, this, this experience, I want to unpack what that is about. And this is the place that I want to do the project. And amazingly, I don't know what you, you know, gave them the smoke, but uh, they agreed. Uh, yes, we'll let this black artist come into our museum and move things around and, you know, just amazing. I know there are reasons and I know that we can talk about that, but, uh, or you can ask me about that, but it was just an amazing, uh, just, anyway, the stars opened up, everything aligned when I got to do this project, obviously. And the whole museum, I, I don't know how long, if, if you're all from Baltimore for forever, or if any of you haven't been, but remember, and remember what it was like, um, it's, um, no, this was what it was like. <laughs> That's about it. Uh, next. So my project was on the, I was given the entire third floor for the project. And, um, and basically the process was to look at everything and talk to everyone. And uh, that's what I did. I spoke to the guards, I spoke to the ladies in the food service, I spoke to the uh, people who cleaned the, the building, talked to the the, the chief curator a lot, uh, and uh, the registrars and everyone, and the director, and and board members when they wanted to talk to me, and uh, and from that, and uh, I got a sense of what the place, and also uh, looked at everything, looked at every everything that I could get, I could. Of course, the, the collection was huge, and so. Um, you know, I didn't get to, I didn't see everything, but particularly looking in their, in their, in their, um, their documents of the, what was in the collection as well uh, was very enlightening. And that's kind of how I, I began the project, the project. And then I spoke to people outside the museum, encouraged by, by uh, um, George and Lisa, because I was not kind of a, a you know, I was an artist kind of, just like more artists are, kind of more hermetic. Uh, however, they encouraged me to talk to beyond the museum, and we met with groups from outside the museum. Since I'm not from Baltimore, I did want to know about how this sat within, within Baltimore as a museum. So this, uh, in their storage rooms, I, I came across this globe that said truth on it, and that was kind of amazing to me. It's like, well, what does that mean? Um, and who's truth in a museum? You know, or where is the truth? You know, in the world, and 
So I felt this was the perfect thing to start my exhibition with. And uh, it was actually a trophy for truth in advertising. And, uh, and then they, it, it came off view and, you know, because no, people, I guess, stopped really believing there's truth in advertising. But, um, and then it went to the museum, of course. Uh, and then I, so I had a label that said, you know, about the globe, that it was a tr trophy for truth in advertising, and then also a label for the mounts that said plastic mounts, you know, made 1970s, maker unknown. Because I wanted people to look at everything in the museum, not just as one would with the objects, just understand the environment and how that, how that is also telling you what to think. Um, Something else I wanted to say. Oh, well, by this time, before I put this on view and people saw me choosing, uh, in the museum, saw me choosing things, they were worried about, well, what, what are you going to name this thing? You know, we have to title. The PR department was like, come on, we want, you want to, you know, whatever this is going to be, we want to sort of let people know about it. So, and the director, you know, he was a great guy. He said to me, why don't we call it Museum Held Hostage? And I'm like, no, we'll get along here. It's really good. not going to be that bad. He was a little nervous, a little nervous, but anyway. <laughs> so I, I called it uh, mining the museum because that's what I was doing. I was digging up things. I was uh, maybe going to blow up some ideas about museums, but certainly I really wanted to make it mine because I was so, felt so uncomfortable in, a muse in this museum and I didn't really you know, focus on why because I've been to many museums. But this is the first thing you saw. Next slide. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure some of you saw the show, but I, I, um, I looked all around the museum for various things, and I, so I decided to put these busts on view. Uh, and um, whether they, any of them had actually been in Maryland, you know, you know, that was up for grabs. But anyway, we have uh, on on the far uh, the far left. On the far right is Henry Clay, wonderful American. On the far right, uh, Andrew Jackson, not my favorite president, by the way. Um, and, and then in the center was Napoleon. Now, even with my limited education, I knew that he was not in Baltimore. <laughs> I did find out why eventually, but uh, why his bust was there. It was a relative of his, but anyway. Uh, and then on the opposite side, were three empty pedestals, uh, but no busts, but all with names. Uh, Harriet Tubman, Benjamin Banneker, Frederick Douglass. Uh, and I work, looked at all their archives. I looked at all their storage. Nothing about any of these three characters. And so, instead of the busts, I put their names and let people ask the question. Sometimes the absences says so much more about institution. Certainly, what's on view tells you a lot, but what's in storage tells you even more, especially an old museum like this. Next image. Oh, there you go. Uh, next image. And, you know, th throughout this museum, wherever they could, they had a cigar store Indian. Uh, and, uh, Right before the exhibition was a duck decoy exhibition in that space. And they had a, a map, which is that map. I told them, well, keep the map of the Chesapeake Bay and all the duck hunting clubs. I just uh, labeled, relabeled it with native community, native tribes of that time on that map. Just add that on. And in addition, I asked the curator, um, I'd like to speak to the native community, uh, which is not something unusual for me to do uh, when I'm doing this project about this place. And, she, and the curator, being trying to be really helpful, she said, well, there are no Indians in Maryland. I'm like, oh, really? So we went out and found the native, at least one native community and uh, basically talked about what I was doing in this project and uh, borrowed photo, family photographs historic and contemporary photographs, which are on the wall behind these, uh, these cigar store Indians. And um, so you cannot take the, the faces in of the cigar store Indians, and the real, but the real community is, is there. 
at the one on the far, this one on the far right is, uh, was by uh, of a, a little girl, an image of a little girl, uh, this, this cigar store Indian girl, uh, and it was sculpt the sculptor used his daughter as, as anyway, that was just the story they told. Anyway, next slide. Uh, so this is a very big exhibition. This is just some of the things that I was that I that I liked uh, that I did uh, among the many things. This was a painting called Country Life, made by Ernest Fisher, and uh, painted in 1850. Now in 1850, people uh, artists were not naming their paintings necessarily. So I figured if it wasn't the artist, it had to be the cu a curator, a dealer, art dealer. Uh, a registrar, somebody named it Country Life. So I figured, well, if it wasn't the artist, I could name it too. So I put a, my title on the other side of the painting. Next image. Mine says, Frederick Serving Fruit. Now, uh, it could have been Frederick Douglass. Uh, my name is Frederick. Um, and, uh, but it's amazing how a shift in emphasis is created by a mere change of a title. It, that, this painting never had a real title, but. So I'm you know, definitely trying to make people look closer and think about their experience in museums and the, 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 uh, the fictions and, the, and which everyone thought I was making something fictional, but in fact, it was all a fiction in this particular image. Uh, next. Ah, yes. Uh, I uh, dug around in, in their basements and uh, loved the Repousse Silver. And as you know, they were at, if you were around long enough, you remember that there were two, uh, two rooms, basically. There was the north and there was the south. And there was no, the two rooms never came in. Things from those rooms were always separate. Um, so I, Loved the silver, so I had to put it out there. But I also found in the ledger books this uh, the list in there. It said shackles, and so I had to dig around trying to find where this was. We we never did actually. The truth is, we never did find the shackles. Uh, so we borrowed some, and I put them in there under he the heading of metalwork, 1793 to 1880, uh, because the museum at that time, you know, was pretty much about you know, connoisseurship, uh, it was by, by material even more than it was, uh, you know, about history. And so I did the same thing, metalwork. Certainly whose hand had to serve the silver, whose, uh, you know, um, uh, who could have learned that kind of metalwork in apprenticeship situations at the end of slavery, but certainly whose labor uh, produced a wealth that could produce the silver. So there was uh, no reason not to put them in the same case. Next image. Oh, there is a close-up in case you didn't see it. There we go. Uh, and this is uh, cabinet making. I sort of try to, to keep that with that, uh, with that idea and uh, of the uh, kind of sourship display. And you know, the cur one of the curious, uh, is this, that big thing was in sitting in the basement and I was walking around the basement and uh, uh, this was lying there and I said, well, what's that? And the curator said, oh, that was the public whipping post. They used that in front of the, 19, in front of the city jail until 1958. We don't know what to do with that thing. I said, well, I know what to do with that thing. <laughs> Uh, and they were very gracious about it. I, I, you know, they, they all, they, they would say, you want to use that? Go right ahead. You want to put these things? Go right ahead. It's not on me. It's going to be on you. Probably on the director, too. Uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, and so I, I borrowed these other, um, these other chairs and thought about them as choosing the chairs, different um, members of society uh, looking at this, this image. Next slide. Oh, it's funny. I thought I might have had uh, a broadside for Robert, but I guess I didn't. But um, 
so I was interested in the, uh, this, the broadsides that they had, and uh, the broadsides were were in their in their uh, their the registrar's area were filed by the reward because and they explained it's because it was the largest words on the page and so that's how they filed them. Um, so I thought that was fascinating uh, and how, anyway, you can just think about that. Um, and uh, so I decided because the names of the enslaved, were, uh, the first name of the enslaved at least were in the text, um, I decided to, I wanted people to see what these things were actually saying and I pulled out uh, in the descriptions of people uh, I, so these are facsimiles, and so I could recreate it and um, had a layer that came forward, kind of sli slightly separate, so you could read it better. Uh, things that would say, in describing the, the enslaved, uh, he hesitates when spoken to. He has a, uh, a kick. He, had a, he has a, a, a broken something, leg or something, because of a kick from a horse, perhaps. Um, and various things, uh, various things like that. So that in this image where the largest thing is the reward, the name of the person is maybe the second largest thing. And then who, who was looking for him was also pretty large. I wanted a little more to see the abuse embedded in, even in the, uh, the, image, the quest to find these people. Next. Oh, this is not historical site anymore. <laughs> Uh, these are works that, um, like the guard, guards, I should, before I, the guards were in Maurice's show. Um, and um, it was really a wonderful experience working with Maurice because he was really very, uh, you know, astute and, and really understood my work. Well, obviously, he understood my work in a deep way. And, uh, so his choices, and his choices for what, uh, what he wanted was uh, to use was, you know, specific. Um, and he also showed things that had never been shown before, not in a gallery, not anywhere, things that, that I had made, uh, or something I made a long time ago that people had forgotten. So I was very pleased. It's like putting some photographs of mine, which nobody ever really paid attention to at that time. So um, I just wanted to mention that, and, this, and these works, I made after being after going being in a show in the South and uh, and start and start collecting these collectibles, so-called so collectibles. I call them degradaria, but anyway, they're, uh, uh, and so I wanted to make works with these with these objects, and so I started collecting them. I don't collect them anymore. For years, people started would send me things saying, "Oh, my grandmother had this, and I don't know what to do with it. Here, you can have it." I'm like, "No, I'm not doing that work anymore. I'm done." I got what I want out of it. Anyway, this is called The Conversation. Next slide. Inside Story. I actually broke that thing by accident when I, you know, nothing goes to waste around my studio. Next. Uh, this is called Made in Boston, because I made it in Boston. I found all these things in Boston. Next. And uh, in front of the the photograph on the table, it says mine, and in front of the, the, these collectibles, so-called, is says yours. Next image. And this is an atlas. I made a little atlas of the black world at that time. It's kind of shifting his service to something in service to something more important. Next image. Oh, I made it to the Venice Biennale. Uh, yeah, I was invited to, to, to represent the US for, in, in Venice. And um, uh, so this was very exciting for me. I had been to Venice. But uh, with the subject matter in my head, it just seemed like something great. And I, uh, I spoke to him when I was there. You know, you go back to do this project, project because I'm very immersive. Uh, I was there for coming and going for the year. Well, not even, a, I didn't even get a year. That's a whole other story why that didn't happen. But anyway, um, 
And, but I realized that uh, Africans had been in Venice for a very, very long time, very, very long time, in one way or another. And, you know, so Othello, while he was fictitious, and Desdemona wasn't, uh, his actual being there was not any kind of a surprise to anyone. Wouldn't have been a surprise to anyone back in, back in the 1700s or 1500s. So I wanted this presence, and also the living presence of Africans in, in Venice. Uh, you know, was even this is going back to 2003. Now, in Italy, there's lots of Africans from various places uh, living and or working or you know escaping uh, from some other place. But at that time, they were seemed totally invisible, except that in Venice, they did acknowledge that there was this uh, a bit of this history there. So I just brought it out as, you know, as much as I could, talking to a lot of the Africans there who were either selling things or living there or visitors or, you know, next. And uh, I say we're there a long time. The, the, in the paintings in the academia, there are many paintings of Africans. This one obviously is the, um, is, uh, well, you know what that is. Um, <laughs> I have these brain fogs every minute. It's not from COVID. Um, anyway, the paintings have many Africans in them. And uh, these are not the, the kind from the 19th century here in the United States. These are not caricatures. These are actual paintings of people that look like Africans. Uh, so not surprisingly, there were Africans there doing you know, various things. Next image. OK. Yeah, same painting. Because you know there are the Turks in, in 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 paintings in Venice, and then you have Africans in the periphery. Next image. Uh, this is by um, uh, Veronese, and it's the huge painting in the Academia, and there are many Africans there, and they're not. Fi it's not fiction. It's fiction. Maybe the image is fi is fiction, but the fact that this uh, that they were there is not at all fiction. And there. Next slide. Uh, well, it's hard to see in here, but many of them uh, were waiters or coming to the dinner in that side, side area. That's hard to see here. But um, next image. Uh, this is by Carpaccio. And uh, the lights can't see them, but down at the lower, at the lower uh, left, uh, there's a black gondolieri. Uh, next image. And a second one in the background. There he is. So this presence was, is not a fiction. Uh, they were there for various reasons. And, I, and you know, the history of Venice, it's very well known, all the various uh, ethnic groups and individuals coming from various countries, you know, the f famous, uh, the well-known first, first Jewish ghetto was there. Um, but there's no history connected with the Africans there. The, the, the research hasn't been done to the degree that would uh, place them there and as, as much as they were. Although there are, there are many different jokes, or not jokes, sayings in the, in the language and I images, on, you know, door knockers and what have you from you know, 1500s of Africans imagery there. Next. Uh, and uh, this is a, a painting by Tiepolo and there's a black child there in the painting. Next slide. And here's another Tiepolo painting with the same black child uh, there, playing a moor, actually. Uh, next image. And then here's the painting that I've, what I had seen or had in my, my house, the, uh, the image. And at this point, here at this point, I found out that that boy is named Ali. And this is a painting uh, by Tiepolo of his of his wife, who was the subject of the painting, and himself at, at painting his wife and his studio assistant Ali in the pa painting, and was in in the paintings of where you see Ali, he's growing, getting older. You can see that he was there for quite a while. Anyway, so that long trajectory was good for me to kind of finally have it. Yes, that's who he is, Ali. Next image. 
And uh, from those paintings, I made uh, costumes, or I had costumes made of the, from the, these figures in the painting, either it's the, the Magi or whatever. And because the, the, the pavilion, for some reason, has a very odd big glass wall like it's a shop. So I figured I'd put mannequins in it like it was a shop in San Marco. Next image. Oh, here's another painting by Montaigne. I believe it's Montaigne. And uh, with the black, this is a, um, you know, the uh, Emmaus image. Uh, and, you know, the, I went to Rossi, uh, uh, Rotti, uh, the fashion uh, house in, in near Lake Como, uh, because I wanted to make these costumes. And, and so the, the histori historian there, you know, wanted to help me with that. And she could tell, tell me everything about all the costumes of all the other characters and the history behind them. And then when it came to the, the black man's costume, she said, oh no, that was a fantasy costume. But I studied in West Africa, and uh, this is strip woven cloth. Uh, really early, but this is what this is. So there's many ways that people can sort of, just by not knowing, even your own, in your own field, not knowing something kind of makes uh, the real history disappear. Next slide. Oops, there it is again. Next slide. So I reproduced that cloth as best, best I, I could, and, and, and part of my mannequins in the, in the window, store window. Next image. Yeah. And then there were other paintings, of, oh, one of the waiter boys and such from the paintings that I, that I saw. Next image. And then I, with the scraps of, of, the, um, of the clothing, I had these handbags knockoffs, uh, you know, Prada and uh, Fendi and such. And I had one of my Senegalese friends sit there sort of basically guarding them. Uh, but people thought they were for sale. And you can see the people in the, in the mirror online waiting to get into the pavilion. But people also would come over and, and see if, you know, if they could buy one of these things. But, uh, and then he'd have to say, no, they're not for sale. And uh, so the, the same material it's the, that these historic characters are, are wearing. And this woman here, what he, this, this, this guy spoke several different languages, which is great because sometimes people actually engage him in conversation. And he, he talked about the, the, the plight of uh, this, you know, Senegalese, particularly in, in Italy. Next image. And this is the Statue Unity di America. This is, if you haven't been, that's, this is the front of the building. And um, the, um, everybody thought I would do something about this Jeffersonian style building, but you turn around and there's Venice. Who wants to do anything about Jefferson when you're in Venice? Uh, but, and the, but these big, these huge statues uh, are, are not American. People thought that, you know, oh, Fred's doing something about American slavery in Venice. But in fact, these are, statues that are in the Florida church, there are four of them, uh, that are marble. This is just a scrim. Like all over Venice, you've got scrims of buildings in front of the building. Um, and uh, so I had these made, and it looks like they're holding up to pediments. Uh, so again, here you have, um, this is ancient Venetian imagery on an American statue, on an American building, which kind of looks perfectly at home. <laughs> There, unfortunately, uh, they were they were um, they were. Uh, uh, never mind. I see. I can get, get into the weeds with the history of all these things, but um, they were uh, saved by was saved. Uh, I can't remember the word. Next. And as we walked into the uh, the building, uh, I had just had a. a uh, an experience working with glass two or three years earlier at Pilchuck in Seattle. And so I had glass in my head, uh, maybe not literally, but I had glass in my head. And so when I got to Venice, you know, Murano was there, these incredible glass blowers. And so I went to Murano and I said, I want to make a chandelier. Eh, no problem. I, I want it to be really big. Eh, I can do anything. It's eh, no problem. I said, I want it to be black. He said, oh, black uh, artists. So anyway, I can do anything. I made a sculpture for Yoko Ono. I can do whatever. Anyway, uh, so 
so I wanted to, I mean, you know, the, the chandeliers in, in Venice are pastel colors because, of course, they were supposed to reflect light, and make the place lighter. And I wanted to have a black chandelier because uh, uh, I was thinking about Othello a lot uh, when I was there. Uh, and so this is, the title of this is um, Speak of Me As I Am, which is a, a line from Othello. And, you know, he was, uh, he was monstrous, he was, you know, magnificent, and, but he also was mournful. And I felt the black on the, on the chandelier kind of said, said all that to me. It, it became spindly rather than larger and, and, and uh, um, you know, uh, light, light and airy and heavy and uh, um, all those things I just mentioned. I also painted the inside of the space to look more like uh, San Marco or St. Mark's uh, Basilica uh, rather than the white walls of, of, of uh, this Jeffersonian building to bring more of Venice into, into the space through the color of the walls. Next image. Uh, this is called The Wanderer. They had these all in front of, the, in front of hotels, uh, these figures with, you know, actual African head, uh, and, uh, and, but while this show, while this was up, apparently uh, my, some other artist friends were telling me that, you know, they start covering their, their figures, <laughs> a little embarrassed during, during the vernissage. Next image. Oh, and this is sort of a montage of all the different images and actual Africans there today and in various centuries in the past. Uh, my assistant was a uh, young uh, Afro-Filipino who grew up there, and so he was fun to go around with on a chandelier. He was quite handsome, and you know, he was enjoying his his unusualness among the ladies. What can I say? As we gondoliered through the through the through the city. Next. Oh, here's one I didn't take the head off. Uh, next slide. Uh, when I took the pillow off, there were these pegs in his wrists, like he was showing me his pain. It's, it was just too much, uh, so I left it like that. Next image. Uh, it's called Love's Blindness. Next image. This is called Helping Hands. Uh, you may, the figure is from the Lacoon group, and the hands are, were sculpted by Canova. And, of course, the black guy was probably holding up a table initially. Next. And, um, yeah, I re redid these, these uh, chandelier, little uh, candelabra things uh, that were probably from La Scala, uh, the image that, that sculpture, uh, that uh, opera house. And uh, basically, you know, if he wanted to, you know, burn down the house, he had the... He had the stuff to do it. Next image. Or put the fire out. No, the first one was spark. This is snuff. Next. Uh, this is called shatter, I think. But it's there. These are made in, in Murano for tourists, except the middle one. I added this Molotov cocktail in the center. But next image. And this was the first piece I did in glass in, in, in Seattle, and so it was not too long before, so I decided to put that in the, in the picture. It's called Drip Drop Plop. And uh, it, it, working with the drips, I, because I'm so heavily weighted in meaning and, and history, uh, these objects have free me up to just do, just to make them. And uh, at that time, years ago, I put, would put arm eyes on some of these things, and I realized this is just, stuff from my childhood, like bubbling up, cartoons from my childhood bubbling up, these racist kind of uh, characters. And so I got that out of my system. I still love working with black glass, and, and I love the fact that, and these drip forms, uh, they could be ink, tar, oil. Uh, and so I still, I don't, I'm done with the eyes. They're, they're, I make them to sort of mean many things. Next. And this is a piece 
uh, is I, I mapped the Atlantic slave trade and the Indian Ocean slave trade, and also the consumers and producers of oil. And this piece is called The Unnatural Movement of Blackness. And that's the last image. Thank you. I, I meant to say one thing that, that was not true. Uh, Maurice wasn't, didn't make the first uh, retrospective. He made the only one. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Can we hear me? Okay, thank you. No, I'm glad you... I think that's really important, especially in terms of our honoring Maurice to see that, because as I say, he certainly looked back at mining the museum very carefully, but he also looked prior to that, and he also looked at your studio practice. He looked multiple ways of that. So it's wonderful, I think, for us to, to both see that in terms of how the, your talk is framed from Maurice's retrospective with you and now afterwards what's happened you know, since then for us to see that. Um, and it's also interesting in terms of, of you talking about mining um, because you, you're showing us that practice that goes back like 40 years right. now. Oh. And yes. uh, whereas, you know, mining, this is the celebration this month of its 30th anniversary. And I want to read a, a quote from the, catalog, from, the, from the catalog that the Contemporary published uh, with the New Press and, and Fred um, after the show closed that Lisa Korn, who was the curator uh, working uh, at, with Jennifer Goldsberg at, at the Historical Society, that this is something she wrote 30 years ago, and now we're here today talking about these issues still. She says, 30 years ago, mining the museum happened at a very specific moment in American history and in the history of the museum. I wonder if we went back through the years or we went forward 30 years, whether mining the museum would have the same impact on the museum community and museum audiences. So I mean, I think it's telling that, sadly, that, that <laughs> the answer to that question is yes and no. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of us talking about what's happened in those 30 years and seeing your, your continual interventions and, and uh, uh, with your installations and your studio practice that you've been doing since then. But I, I guess I want to, before we open up the audience to questions, I want to make sure, since my interest in inviting the three of you in conversation uh, today was to have a, a, a few minutes of our, our time that the three of you have a chance to talk about things after hearing each other's work. Um, I guess I'd first like to sort of ask Ashley and Chris if perhaps if each of you have a question or a comment especially as it relates to your work or Maurice's practice that you would like to pose or, or comment to Fred. Well, uh, I asked Fred when we were just catching up, I was catching up with Fred Wilson before this panel, um, how it feels to be everybody's hero because he, um, his work has been so important in my own practice and my understanding of what's possible as an artist and as an educator. I mean, I taught mining the museum every single semester without fail, oh and I, goodness. you know, whether I was teaching art or American studies, um, what's that like? <laughs> oh, being in that position. Um, Becoming a legacy. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> Thank oh, you, George. Uh, I don't, it's, it's, it's kind of a hard, you know, you never expect, you don't expect things like that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I guess different people take it differently. I'm just, just thrilled to still be at the party. You know, I, it's very, um, uh, it's really very uh, sobering to understand that some of the things that I spoke about a long time ago still have resonance today. That's just, Unbelievable, and some of the things are good and some of them bad. But you know, it's uh, as far as you know, 
uh, still issues still remain. But um, uh, it's very, it's, I mean, all I can say is really gratifying. It's like an incredible honor to have people still think that that exhibition is important and, uh, and uh, um, it's just, you know, I'm just very thankful about that because I think some of the things I brought up were needed to be said and uh, nobody was saying it. It's always for me, it's, that's the thing. What, if I'm in an institution, and institutions are easier to, to manage because everybody's nice you know, generally and there are a few, you know, but mostly everybody's nice and, and uh, they may not agree with you, they may not, you know, we are your vision, but they respect you, well, at least me, for, for uh, my, my perspective, and, and then the perspectives of various people within the institution can, can uh, become who they are, more present in the institution, because I, I'm, I was there. And that's also very, I mean, I'm very pleased with that. Uh, that kind of thing, but it's just for me, uh, you know, it's just hard for me to to, to kind of um, let let this this incredible amount of attention that I get you know, wherever I go, uh, it, and, and it's not like just fanboy thing. It's just they're just uh, sincerely interested in what I what I've done and and what I continue to do. It's, it's just, it's the, um, the thing that you never expect, you know, and it's very, you know, very gratifying on a deep way, what can I say? I think also, actually, for you, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, you, as, a, as you say, as a teacher, and I was influenced you as an artist, but, you know, thinking in terms of your presentation and, and, and what you're working in the, in the community and archiving their history, you know, and then using the current technology with the app and the website and the reservation map and all those, those things that, that sort of are documenting that, that, that memory that, I mean, you've taken it, <laughs> you've taken being influenced by what Fred's done into a direction that's making it yours. I mean, just as Fred made my, <laughs> his installation, his, you've made what you're doing and your identity and your history and your community in the same way. Yeah. Chris? Yeah, I'm actually, I'm curious about maybe your earliest memory of when you were doing process work or sculpture work, when the, there was this unconscious that turned conscious between you, you're juxtaposing a, 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 an idea around race or around, you know, maybe a personal idea around the actual form of the sculpture. Do you have a memory of when that started to hit you and that it excited you? Besides Artemis Bass or before yeah, that? Yeah, or, yeah. yeah. Uh, not, well, not really. I can't say what, uh, I don't know, juxtaposing, you know, I guess the best way to say it is that Throughout my life, I always felt juxtaposed with whatever else was around me. And I felt I could feel either the tension or the, the, uh, the amicable relationship. Uh, and it's kind of, and also, uh, I'm, probably not the, I'm not the only person who experienced this, that where how people receive you how they see you is their way of seeing you. And you may not see yourself that way. You may not understand yourself that way. Or maybe they don't understand you. They're just coming to you really tabula rasa and just kind of trying to figure you out. And, or they have a lot of assumptions about you and uh, that either get dispelled as you get to know them or you don't, or it doesn't because either they're very close and it stays within them as what who and what you are, uh, and never wanting to get deeper involved, or uh, you know, you are juxtaposed within their environment, and so they read you in a certain way. Because my, we, my family moved every five years, and not in large, just different kinds of neighborhoods, uh, not uh, 
great distances. Lord knows I don't know what that would be like. But so I really my work is a lot a lot about that, even though I'm not doing it on purpose. Uh, it's about how things read in in different situations, and uh, and really they're all, it's me, you know. Hmm. It's interesting so you're asking that question cause to, to Fred because looking at the work you've been doing and with, with Strikeware where you're working in these sometimes historic spaces and yeah. places and trying to sort of recreate in those untold stories in your own work. I mean, uh, clearly, and as you say, talking about Maurice's legacy here and Fred's that uh, I see that that you sort of use those as touchstones yourself in, in your work. Yeah, yeah I, I think I, I feel it like, um, I, be, I, I feel like it's a part of my work that I'm, uh, it's becoming more of a, a label to my work, you know? And I don't know where the, um, I don't know where that's coming from sometimes. So that's why I was curious in that mm -hmm. question, you know, like what is the, is it, is it rooted in historicity? Is it rooted in um, culture? Is it rooted in your, like oneself to come up with this kind of like these forms to, to say is something more than just the form itself, right? Thank you. So Fred, I want to give you a chance if you have any questions or comments to Ashley or Chris about their practice. Okay. We just met like an hour ago, right? Yeah, 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 it's all right, it's all right. Uh, uh, or excuse me, or, or, or I mean like, like why are they seeing, why did I invite them to sit here next to you and be part of this conversation? There's like hundreds and hundreds of artists that we could have invited or curators to be here in those two chairs. Yeah. Um, well. If I was to think deeply about this, take your in time. The in the moment, uh, you're a brilliant man. That's that's one reason. Um, <laughs> but um, also, I mean, it, it, there is a, a, a even though there's not necessarily a juxtaposition in, in the way I do it, there there is a great uh, um, way of sort of. Creating, uh, creating something that uh, shows a different vantage point about about a thing. I mean, that to me that that uh, is very, you know, much. I do it with objects, but you know, you've done it in your various ways. It's juxtaposing. Um, uh, Things that are not, you know, necessarily well with you, is, you know, things that are not necessarily meant to be juxtaposed, uh, and uh, or 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 kind of mined uh, to the degree that you've done, and I, I totally think that uh, bringing out the the. Uh, the inner, the hidden, uh, or just unnoticed uh, uh, humanity and 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 uh, of a community is, you know, it's it's you know, uh, and allowing it to sort of surface with other people is really kind of very similar to what I try to do, and without. You know, hitting people over the head of, of, a, of a meaning, and uh, right. it just kind of full comes out very naturally, and and uh, uh, which is a great way to rec for others to receive it. You know, that's kind of how I see both of you. It's a very, it's not hit yourself, it, it's somebody over the head with with uh, an idea. It's sort of developing the idea or developing. Um, the important issues that, that bubble up from whatever subject you're working on. And so it becomes much more interesting to receive it for the for the, the viewer. So I mean so many people in their desire to to make a statement just make it so 
overblown or so, um, you know, dogmatic or, or obvious that it, you lose all the ability to connect with people and, and let them, you know, kind of understand it for themselves, grapple with it, or just get an aha moment, you know. So that's where I see us sort of having a, a really, really wonderful kind of connection in our practices. Mm. Thank you, Fred. Also, I guess I just wanted to sort of highlight that I, I just love the fact that because many times people always talk about mine in the museum and they strictly concentrate on the, the mining of the African-American history, the African-American history, right? right? right, right. And, and um, matter of fact, there's many presentations and books that don't show the Native American, oh, what okay. you uncovered, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I know Ashley and I have talked about that a lot, about that her seeing the book, mm -hmm. you know, seeing the book and the catalog that was in there, mm -hmm. not having seen that show, oh, right. that what that what that meant, that everyone always thought it was just about the African American. Mm -hmm. and, and am I correct, because that's part of your heritage too, correct, Fred? A grandma, a grandparent? Well, it's, that's a whole long, yeah. long subject yeah. on both sides of my family. Both sides, <laughs> yeah. You know, well, yeah. It's, you know. Okay. Well, we're going to open up to a few questions. I think we have a few, oh, some time left for a few questions. I think Linz has a hand mic to take around to people. It should be next to you in the right bottom. Oh, yeah. Hi, thanks for this. Um, I'm thinking about the thread we were just on about curation, and it struck me. Um, what a juxtaposition of Maurice's work and legacy. It, it, it's such a juxtaposition with the way that Fred was describing the curators um, that, were, uh, that, were, that were there when Mining the Museum was happening. And it just strikes me that, um, that so many curators now, largely thanks to the work of people like Maurice, our allies are even co-conspirators with artists and with others making cultural commentary. This is a question for you, Ashley, sorry. This is a long <laughs> preamble, but I guess this is uh, the way into asking you because you are an artist and, um, and you are now a curator. Um, if you could say more about um, what it means to you to be in a curatorial role and, and how you're thinking about um, your art practice and um, what you hope to do as a curator. Tell us more. Well, uh, I've been at the Smithsonian, I keep saying for about five minutes. <laughs> I started in September and people keep asking me what I do now. And um, it seems to be a lot of the same things. I, I was permitted to continue my practice as an artist on the clock. Mm. I. Um, also do the way I explain what curation is to my students when I was a teacher. It's about juxtapositions to craft a narrative and you also wield a lot of power. You get to decide what um, is made to be in the forefront, what must recede into the background. Um, so exercising that a little bit, um, working as an advocate, that's also been you know, a part of my practice just as a human being. Um, this, this week, for example, I got to work with a fellow Native artist, colleague, friend, who's going to do a, a great performance um, at one of our institutions. And um, the fullness of what she had planned, the, the Smithsonian, Smithsonian can be very risk averse. And they brought me in as a curatorial advisor. And I was like, well, you know, why don't we trust her to do the ethical things? And, and uh, the artist later told me that the, the powers that be did a complete 180 since we were there on her side. Um, so I think, you know, art is my superpower and uh, I think of everything that I do, you know, especially since this whole PhD journey, it seems like my expansive is just, my practice is very expansive, it's all art. I approach everything as an artist and I will Use my power for, for good. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Go
Good evening, how y'all doing? Um, I just want to say this is an amazing panel. Um, thank you, Ashley, Chris, Fred, and George um, for having this tonight. Uh, my question is uh, directed at Chris, but um, it's open to the panel as well. Um, and my question is about uh, like the use of technology. Um, so you use a lot of augmented reality, um, virtual reality in your work. And my question is, how do you see the future of technology, especially like we're going with Web 3.0 and Metaverse playing a role in um, the curatorial practice, even in museum studies and for artists? And maybe for the panel opening it up, do you see this as an asset or a detriment to the field? Yeah. Um, I can never predict art movements with technology. I, I don't really keep track of NFTs or the metaverse. Um, I have a virtual reality headset on my desk that I haven't touched since I bought it. And I, I, I see the work of technology playing like a, um, I've used it as a kind of an education tool um, to kind of expose something or to uh, reveal something in the work. Um, but I, I started in a very analog form, so I would be building the sculpture and adding the technology into it so that they could kind of be symbiotic um, in the gallery space. Um, when I think about um, augmented reality, virtual reality, extended reality, I think that these are technologies that have been around for decades and that they're just becoming more democratized, but they're also forms of technology like this have a, are rooted in, um, uh, I mean, not to sound too academic, but it's rooted in kind of a capitalist industrial complex. So it's about, uh, you know, we have these tools for surveillance in a way, um, where they started, their, their inception was for the military use. Uh, and it's been kind of like now commercialized for us to game with or, um, for us to kind of be in another world. Um, and it's still in its nascent beginnings. I, I, I think in the art world, um, when, when Strikeware was using this work, it's, we were all coming out of this, um, this program together at UMBC in digital art. And we all had our strengths in it. And Molly and Jeff brought in uh, their strengths with the digital aspect of uh, they're creating and now we're all creating like work out of like 3D modeling. We're doing a lot of 3D modeling now. And um, I mean, this is a long answer, but you know, in the fine art world, there's people like Jacoby Satterwhite who, who uses the work for uh, what I see, a telling of a story and <clears throat> an immersion. You're, you're, immersing, you're immersing yourself in this experience. And that to me is the most interesting use of the technology when you flip it to tell something, not to necessarily, necessarily to make money off of it, but to, you know, you're not creating games, but you're, you're, you're immersing yourself in some narrative that you just wouldn't otherwise realize without the technology. So I, I would hope that, again, like kind of like to mirror what Ashley said, it's like to use it for good um, but also to kind of um, to, to kind of question what the system is, uh, to me is what the use of the technology in the art world is. So to question the spaces that we, we we're in, to question how, I mean, I'm being very abstract, but I think it's a very broad question to say um, technology plays a a good role in our lives. I think it plays a, a ulterior role and it, it, it has its own motive. We have our, our motives with, with um, how we create things and it's very, yeah, it's, it's, it's always a new world. It's always, you're buying the next latest and greatest, you know, and it just collects dust in a way that maybe the dust is kind of interesting too, like whatever's. The, the oldness of it, yeah. I don't know. That's a. So uh, my name is Allison Tolbin, and 
I am the Vice President of Collections and Interpretation at the Maryland Center for History and Culture, or what was the Maryland Historical Society. And uh, I would love to know how you convince a bunch of historians to let you do contemporary artwork. Uh, but my real question is that we have talked about how 30 years ago, mining the museum was relevant. And that same conversation museums are grappling with today. So what does everyone think we can do today to prevent us from having to have the same conversation in 30 years and sort of this continual wake up call for cultural organizations? Well, as I said in the New York Times, you know, I mean, there are a lot of people doing great things, but at now, but I mean, to me, it's my life, it's been a huge shift. Uh, but the, tr the truth is, America is, is uh, what do you call it, um, fad-based. And so, uh, especially around racial things. So we just have to be careful of the ebb and that it, it, uh, it needs to get, uh, be more Im embedded. The, the, as, as, as it gets more and more positive, as people get, get less afraid, it's about fear, fear of, um, of their scholarship being not important anymore, uh, their ideas maybe not, you know, it's, it's a lot about fear, I think. And if you can get beyond that, I'm not, not only afraid of other people, which you know, is not just in museums, afraid of difference, uh, we just have to be on point, those of us who really believe in this stuff, uh, be on point and sort of just speak up. The speaking up thing also is, can be an issue. Um, I, I said in the Times not too long ago that, oh, well, it was about the, the, uh, the show that, uh, you know, uh, people have to get out of their silos, their curatorial silos. And, you know, I said that, but really, it has shifted so drastically in my lifetime. It, you know, things that are happening now were, were impossible, you know, when I did my museum. Um, well, and so, uh, but we have to be vigilant, you know, and just keep the conversation on the table and keep kind of, um, uh, bringing people in and, and, and for others to have an aha moment. And exhibitions can, I truly believe exhibitions can do that, you know. And, uh, uh, and uh, changing board members can do that. <laughs> uh, so, and, but you do, but it, it can be done in, in not a kind of a harsh way, it's just, uh, Having the aha moments is, is the best is the best way, and linking up linking up with your fellow curators with an institution around where the, the things that you do see eye to eye to develop and, and not be afraid of change, not be afraid of your own of your own um, kind of vulnerabilities and and like I said, your own research being marginalized um, because you know. Let's face it, all, there are a lot of subjects that need to be continually dealt with and, and, and looked into deeply, on not only about race, but a lot of other subjects. Uh, and we just have to put fear aside and, and support people in, in their quest to do that and support others in, uh, in, in their fear of it. So, or to pull them out of their fear. That's kind of... Uh, I, I always say, people that tell me, well, how'd you do what you did? And, and, and in various places, well, you know, basically all I do is talk to people and, 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 uh, and try to get them to see me. If they can see me as, as uh, someone worth talking to, certainly back in the day, then, then you know, it's not, it's not an impossible task. Uh, you don't always see eye to eye about subjects, but you're, but, uh, if you're allowed to create these things uh, or do a sub, an exhibition of a subject and have a response that uh, is a positive response, uh, it, it breeds more. 
and it breeds other people in the institution to try to try harder and try you know in their own world to try to to get that kind of attention be be courage be more um, uh, what do you call it uh, wider thinking in their own practice I mean that's how I you know go about it and I, and I trust even though people who, who I'm working with sometimes really don't see what I what I do do is important but it, you know they let it happen you know and so that's the important part to make let people you know make it happen and then that the exhibition becomes a, di a dialogue around the exhibition for those who are whatever the traditionalist is and for those who are trying different things it's all it becomes a much more interesting uh, dialogue and but it's not about them and us or it's about how you expand people's you know knowledge of things understanding of things as a curator so. yeah I, I don't I don't think it's apolitical either I think it's um, there's a part of it where there's a power structure in place and when you ask about historians and bringing historians into the contemporary art world I mean there's a, these are the kind of intersections that are needed for the complex problems or complex questions that we face um, um, I think where historians might make take fact and create narrative from fact artists are creating questions from the facts that are of that we see um, and we all have to kind of group together and say that yeah the, these issues that we have today um, or these these questions that we're asking they aren't apolitical they're very they're very rooted in a power structure um, I think of your project and how there's an article you you you, you look at an article of, of a, a student who's questioning why the history of Native Americans or indigenous people is not accurate in the classroom they're kicked out of the classroom right and this happens in the 90s or maybe even in the 80s this article I think that was in your your latest project right this person is kicked out of the classroom because they're they're saying no your history is wrong uh, to the teacher and the it teacher, was me right uh, it was you it was me. that was you okay yeah so th right you that was recent right so that's like and we're still like facing I didn't know that was you that's funny um, but I, I think of also like Maurice Berger's when you're talking about white lies and you're, you're thinking about like all these these stories that show they're still very common today and the one story I think about in White Lies was when there's this woman, I don't know who it is, but this woman walks into a country in Africa, I think it's in maybe Cote d'Ivoire or something, and she notices that everyone that's holding weapons is black, right? And the power structure shifts for her. And she notices like, oh, I am, I am solely the white person in this room. And you're talking about, we're, I'm talking about race as the power structure in this conversation, but like, um, it can go to a, a litany of issues that we're looking at how to reframe narratives as artists. We're looking at museums to, you know, pull whatever they have out of their collection to kind of say, this is the dirty truth of what, that, what there is. Um, it is the dirty truth, and there's no way to shine it to make it golden. Like, um, we're not living in a golden era at all. I don't know what to say. That's Ashley, funny. Do you want to respond to her question also? Oh, sure. Uh, you know, this is where uh, my my experience with scholarship in the academy runs up against my um, sensibilities as an artist because when you study in American studies and they teach you about settler colonialism, the special kind of colonialism that we have here in the United States of America. They teach you it doesn't end, it can't end. And when they teach you about racism, it's so baked into American society, we're just stuck with it. And even if you know about it and you can analyze it, you're still part of the system. Like we all drank the Kool-Aid, we're in this, it's not gonna end. And I think um, the way out is by trusting artists who have the ability the visionary ability to, um, to imagine something different. And that's how we get there. Um, also, what Fred said really 
resonated with me about talking to people because that's all I do. Like, I don't know whose slogan it is that the, the shortest distance between two people is a story, but that's so true. Like what seems to be um, so very painfully personal ends up being universal. Like we all kind of just suffer in silence with our, with our experiences. So when we get to talk with one another and swap stories, we see each other as human and it becomes much harder to hate one another or, uh, you know, continue to create conditions that, that cause people like us to have a, a bad quality of life. So I, I think it's like, it's about using our imaginations, trusting audi artists and, um, you know, talking. I'd like to follow up on what's Ashley's response, if I can give my response related to that. Um, and that is 30 years ago when the, for, the, the director at the time of the Historical Society, Charles Lyle, when a Miami Museum got all this acclaim and attention, deservedly, um, there, and he asked, came to the contemporary, wanting us to continue the relationship with him, with the, with the Historical Society. And he, uh, he asked me, what should we, meaning the Historical Society, do next? What's your advice related to your question? My answer to him was three words. Artist, artist, artist. It was a simple answer. Because the only, that happened not because of a curator or a director from the contemporary. Or it ha that happened because of an artist only, not a curator or a historian. They were important partners and collaborators with an artist. As, as you're all talking about, but that's really, the, to me, the, the, the final answer on that. Uh, I'm not sure if, Sandra, do we have any online comments or questions before we close out and have Sims? Um... Okay, thank you, I just wanted to make sure. Anyone else, we okay? Okay, so I think Sims wants to say some final comments. <laughs> that was on my agenda. That was on my agenda that you were going to comment. No, am I wrong? Uh, you welcomed us. No, I think it, I think this went really, really well. It's awesome, and I appreciate everybody's contribution to this panel discussion. And it means a lot to Baltimore, as well as to all of us here tonight and others online, et cetera, to hold this event in, uh, commemoration, in commemoration and, and memory of Maurice, but also Fred's efforts with mining the museum, in particular to Baltimore and the Maryland Historical Society, which it was called then. Uh, but it's great to hear generations interacting and talking with one another and sharing perspectives, but most importantly, approaches how to further integrate art, work, institutional clarity with audiences. And in many ways, I, what I'm taking away in, in sort of a final thought, and it's been, I'm just reiterating what you guys are saying. Um, Fred's experienced major shift in many attitudes since before doing mining the museum, but there's still a lot more work to do. And remaining vigilant and engaged is really, uh, in many ways, I think the mantra in the same way as artist, artist, artist. So in that way, it's been a real pleasure and thank you so much for all of you coming and engaging with the audience tonight. And let's give ourselves a round of applause.